Investment Summit. This is the third year of running this session and the first time we have done so virtually. So pardon all the initial technical glitches. We have just over an hour of an exciting program that will include phenomenal international and local speakers. Before we go on, we'd like to wish President Ramaphosa a happy birthday. My name is Shuloba Mashudu Mawela, and I'll be moderating the session today as the newly appointed Secretariat Co-Lead for Impact Investing South Africa. The ground rules for the session are simple, um, respect and honor the other speaker, other speakers and keep to the allocated time. And I'd encourage everyone to please be unmute if you are not speaking. Um, first up, we're due to welcome um, Elias, who is the chairman of the task force. He unfortunately will then join at a later slot as he was not able to join. So first up, we welcome Nick O'Donoghue, who is the deputy chair of the Global Steering Committee for Impact Investing. Nick, over to you, please. Yes, thank you, Shaluba. Can you hear me? We can hear you perfectly, Great. Nick. Thank you. Thank you and um, good afternoon, good evening, everybody. Um, it's a great pleasure to be here. Um, as Shaluba said, my, my name is Nick O'Donoghue. I'm the chief, in my day job is I'm the chief executive of CDC, which is the UK's development finance institution. Uh, but I also have the pleasure of being the deputy chairman uh, to, uh, of the Global Steering Group for Impact Invest Investment. So I'm here really today representing the GSG and representing our chairman, uh, Sir Ronald Cohen. And so let me just start very quickly by talking, by giving you all a little bit of background about the GSG. Uh, it was formed in 2012 as, as, as a result of the G7 meeting in that year, which, was, which took place in London. And one of the key themes that the G7 identified as an area they wanted to focus on that year was impact investment. But that was to some extent due to the progress that, uh, that impact and, and social investment made in the UK. Uh, but as a result of sort of the success in bringing that 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 idea forward, uh, the UK government helped to sponsor and set up uh, uh, the Global Steering Group. And the ambition of the Global Steering Group was try was really to try and build a network of uh, around the world of what we call national advisory boards that would, uh, in their own particular country, try to work uh, to increase impact and in impact investment in those countries. And so in the sort of eight, eight years since, uh, since then, uh, the GSG and the sort of network of national advisory boards has grown enormously. I mean, and today we are represented, we have national adv advisory boards in 29 different countries. That is most of the major development, developed countries around the world. Uh, and more recently have begun to expand the network into Africa. And I'm pleased to say that South Africa was, I believe, the first national advisory board to be formed in Africa. Sub Subsequently, we've, we have boards in, uh, in Ghana and Zambia, and we're looking at a number of the other African countries, including Kenya and Nigeria and, and Egypt. And Africa is particularly important, I think, to the GSG because unlike uh, it, it represents not only a potential source of capital, particularly in South Africa, but also uh, clearly a, a huge development uh, opportunity and a huge opportunity for impact investment to really uh, to really uh, to really make make a difference so um, what is the what is the what is the uh, global steering committee and the national Ad advisory boards really try to do well basically we try to um, build the ecosystem uh, that will support impact investment and that's uh, and that's really the value of the national advisory board network is that Certain things have worked in some countries, other things work in other countries. And what the, what the GSG tries to do in the national, uh, working with the national advisory boards is to bring together, share best practice, and try to, and sh try to help the field grow in, in every country. And ultimately, uh, 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 as with any market, impact investment is about growing that sort of investing ecosystem. And the investing ecosystem consists really of these of three pillars. The, um, you need demand for capital, so you need some, uh, you know, entrepreneurs and people who can put capital to work to create and make a difference in people's lives. You need supply of capital from investors, both big and small, that 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 are willing to channel their capital uh, to create not uh, to not to to not only maximize their return, but to maximize, if you like, 
their impact adjusted uh, uh, rate of return. And then you need an intermediation layer. You need a, you need a layer of, 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 of banks and fund managers and so on who can bring together those demand and supply, the, that demand and supply of capital. And in order to do that, you need a regulatory framework and you need a government framework. And at all those levels, uh, we hope, uh, the national advisory boards and the GSG can uh, can make a difference in terms of encouraging investors to take up in, impact investment, in terms of helping to create the support for the growth of intermediaries, in terms of helping to uh, to identify areas where impact investment can make a difference, and importantly and crucially, working with government and regulators to try to 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 uh, ensure that there's a policy and advocacy framework in the country that allows impact investment firms to grow. And I think when you look at most of the countries, I mean, originally this movement started in the, U in the US and the UK, but as I said, it spread to many countries around the world. Um, and when you, look at, when you look at what's happened, in, all, in every case, you've seen this evolution of an ecosystem of, 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 uh, of intermediaries, of, of, demand, of, uh, of institutions supplying capital, demanding uh, up projects demanding capital, government support, and also around that an, an, an ecosystem of market builders and professional services firms. So whether they're research firms or advisory firms or headhunting firms, or, uh, or education or, or lawyers and auditors and so on. And so helping all those different pieces of the ecosystem to grow is really the, is really the principal aim of uh, the National Advisory Board's principal aim of the, of, the, of, the, of the GSG as sort of the coordinating body. Um, and I think, as I said, we've had, we think um, impact investment and those of you who've been, I've been personally involved in impact investment really since about 2000, 2008. So I've watched this sort of journey from being uh, a, an idea, I guess, that really had no recognition in any sort of mainstream investing world to an idea that today and a, and a, and a, a method of investing today that you read about all the time that I think every mainstream investment firm has recognized as it needs to have a it needs to have a, a view on and needs to ideally have some uh, a, a product offering. Um, the um, the impact investment community under the auspices of the GSG comes together uh, typically once a year in our global summit. And this year in 2020, our global summit was scheduled to be in uh, in in South Africa. Uh, and unfortunately, and um, thanks to COVID, that that event, that sort of physical event, was cancelled. But we were able instead to have a a very successful uh, uh, virtual uh, virtual event, which brought together an enormous number of people and participants, really from a, uh, from a, around the world. And it was a, a and especially given it was a virtual event, I think it was enormously successful. But, but one of the things that came out of that. Um, is was what we call the leader's declaration for a just and sustainable future and that was an attempt to try to really identify what the key what key principles and priorities uh, sort of lay at the heart of the gsg and the sort of things that we were going to work towards uh the key things we were going to uh, work towards as we went into the 2020s uh, and the first one of those was the idea that we needed to scale up impact investment. It's had enormous growth, as I said, over the last uh, 10 years, but we still have massive problems of, of unemployment, uh, massive issues around inequality, uh, uh, um, obviously the, the, uh, the climate emergency. Um, and all of these things are things that impact investment can play a role in, in helping uh, to solve. And of course, uh, we have um, every country has 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 bought into the sustainable development goals. We have 10 more years to achieve those goals if, uh, by common consent. If we're going to achieve those goals, we're going to have to do that, not just based on a, on aid and grant making philanthropy, but we're going to have to we're going to have to uh, see, attract significant amounts of investment capital. And so in order to do that, we're going to have to substantially scale up uh, the impact investment movement. So that's one part of our of our um, of our sort of leaders declaration and ambition to do that. The second one was to uh, mandate, encourage the mandating of impact transparency uh, among companies. And, you know, we still live in a world today where I think I'm right in saying there's no country, no company in any country in the world anywhere that is really required to produce on a consistent audited basis any non-financial metrics. 
And of course, that makes it very difficult to be an impact investor because you have no, you have lots of financial data to go on to make your financial decision, but very little or nothing to go on from an impact perspective, and certainly little or nothing that's consistent um, and really transparent and audited. So that idea of uh, the idea that Harvard University has been developing, of, uh, which the GSG has been involved in supporting of impact managed accounts, uh, uh, is a very important uh, impact weighted accounts, a very important initiative of the GSG, and the third key priority as captured in the leader's declaration was around the introducing of legislation uh, to empower companies, investors to pursue impact. And I, I, I'm not, I mean, to some extent, South Africa has, I think, a, re, a somewhat developed sort of corporate uh, 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 governance infrastructure encouraging things like back economic empowerment and so on. But in many countries in the world, there's, no, there's actually, the US being a prime example, there were barriers in the way of boards of directors of companies actually implementing policies that are more impact impact oriented. So that idea of making sure that companies and investors are in a position to choose and to Im and to implement uh, impact investment is a key part of the of the GSG's uh, mandate. Um, so that's what we do. I mean, we're trying to translate it into into uh, a number of sort of specific action areas, and the action areas include. Um, a response on informal uh, on in, informal settlement and refugees. Uh, they include uh, making sure that we have a really compelling narrative around Im around impact investment. This is still an idea that sometimes means different things to different people. Uh, we um, ha have an ambition to mainstream what we call outcomes based finance uh, financing, so social impact bonds. Um, for uh, those of you who are familiar with that idea. We're particularly, when we talk about our action areas, particularly specific about Africa, because Africa, when you think about the SDGs and you think about the continent, certainly it has the greatest distance to travel in terms of achieving the, those SDGs. And this is an area, obviously, which CDC, which I uh, have the privilege of leading, is really very involved in day to day. It's essential that we provide uh, that uh, investors, impact investors, provide support to two economies in our, to all the economies in Africa, and I think I'd have to say one of the characteristics of impact investment is it has been that as it's grown, it probably hasn't done as much in Africa as some of its uh, proponents would like and sort of hope, and some and some um, you would expect given uh, its ambitions on the SDGs. Um, then we have an ambition on impact reporting, as I mentioned. We have an ambition on policy around the G7, G20 next year. Um, ambition to make sure that everybody in, with their pension has a choice. Uh, so you don't know, want to mandate people to invest in impact investment products, but we at least want to offer, make sure they're offered the choice. And that isn't always the case. Um, and then finally, we want to try as much as possible to ensure that investment managers all around the world uh, really shift uh, meaningfully towards a process of investment that doesn't just mean risk and return, but means risk, risk return and impact. Um, so, as, as you can hear, there's a lot to do, um, but I think an enormous amount of progress has been made. I think the GSG hopefully has been, and, and the National Advisory Board in South Africa, the South African National Advisory Board, have really been at the, at the, cent at the center of this. Uh, but going forward, we need more fun. We need uh, obviously more funds. We need greater commitment of capital. We need more enabling legislation. Uh, we need better reporting and so on. Uh, but I, but it does feel as if there's enormous momentum uh, behind this idea. And I know from my visits to South Africa that there's uh, momentum also in, in South Africa. We will be holding, um, albeit I think virtually again, the 2021 uh, Impact Investment Summit, GSG Summit, again, uh, will be based in, in South Africa. So that I think for hopefully um, uh, all of you will be able to uh, to join us in that and, uh, and uh, travel with us on this uh, journey that we hope uh, and expect can make a meaningful difference uh, to people's uh, lives in the world that we live in. So I will stop there and uh, thank you all very much for listening. And I guess back to you, Shaluba. Um, thank you, Nick, for that brilliant opening. We appreciate the insight shared and the comprehensive overview of the landscape, landscape internationally and for highlighting um, the three necessary ecosystem elements. Um, next up, let me just confirm Elias has joined. Um,
we would have liked to have Elias on, but let us then maybe move forward. Um, the next, uh, we'll now go on to TAF with Paul Jackson. Um, so the next session showcases two investment opportunities that emerged from the SDG investor map. The first is an affordable housing presentation looking at impact investing opportunities in the sector. And we'll highlight some of the bottlenecks and capital raising. We welcome Paul Jackson, the CEO of TAF. By way of introduction, Paul has been TAF CEO since inception in 2003 and has been involved in development finance since 1987. Um, welcome, Paul, who will also be showing a presentation. We don't seem to have Paul on the line, so I'll just keep things moving um, and move on to the second um, impact investing presentation, which explores a technology-driven platform purpose to enable small businesses to promote their services through matchmaking algorithms for tradesmen called Kandua. Kandua is a mission-driven tech startup and the number one online marketplace for South for home services in South Africa. We are joined by Kundua's co-founder and CEO, Sayo Fulawio. Sayo is passionate about tech entrepreneurship on the African continent and has extensive experience in telecommunications, media, and technology. Welcome, Sayo, and over to you. Fantastic. Um, so, yes, good afternoon, everybody, and thank you for having us, and thank you, Shluba, for the introductions and keeping us moving along. Um, I hope everyone is doing well wherever they are and um, keeping safe and sane. Um, I'd like to tell you a little bit about our company, Kandua. Um, we connect good people to good work, so the work and good people who are needing the work. Um, and we focus very much on the home services space in South Africa. Um, very simply, if you are looking for someone to do uh, um, some work for you, if that's a plumber, a carpenter, an electrician, you'll come on our platform, you'll be able to see their profiles, their ratings, reviews, etc. be matched with them and get the work done. Our mission is really to shorten the distance between having a skill and making a living from it. We found that there's a bunch of people who have something great, and I'm sure everyone here has someone like that. Um, and they don't know what moves to make, um, kind of how to grow their business beyond just being good at it. Um, and what we found is that in this space of home services, your um, kind of in the built environment jobs, um, it's a massive boon to SMEs and to employment when you can get people, when you can connect these kinds of service providers to markets. So we found in the last five years, this sector alone has added about 100,000 jobs to the economy, right? And, and you know, th these are the kinds of um, interventions that we hope will help us build out um, solutions for SMEs, which obviously will then follow on um, from an employment perspective. So I think the best way to explain kind of what we do is to look at a service provider. So Dan, as we call him, was maybe in 2015, we met him in 2016. And Dan was a carpenter under another carpenter doing some work. Um, and he basically kind of used public transport to get from job to job. He would lug um, a little um, kind of machine that he would use for his carpentry around with him and really kind of had no idea how to market himself. He was kind of mild-mannered and just very good at what he did. And Dan joined us actually as one of our first service providers in 2016. And kind of what you realize when you talk to Dan and when you really um, engage with him about what he needed, he'll tell you, you know, what I'm looking for is new customers. What I'm looking for is new customers. I, I have, you know, two or three people that give me jobs once in a while, but I'm able, I'm unable to grow my business. And I don't know anything about digital marketing. I don't know anything about traditional marketing. I'm just really good at being a carpenter, but I need more customers. And this, this kind of um, um, pattern is one that we found is really, really prevalent across the different services that we cover. And I really like this quote from Mike, you know, um, who is the uh, national director of the uh, the ECA, the Electrical Contractors Association of South Africa, who, who says as a contractor, you don't need funding, you need a job. 
You know, I'd rather have 1 million Rand in turnover than 1 million Rand in investment. And this is the kind of problem that we're looking to solve is really about capacitating people to be able to employ more people, make a life for themselves with what they have. Um, and that's how Kanduo was born. So, you know, and let alone, by the way, just to, to kind of add an, another side of it, is that I'm sure everybody here will say that they, they have struggled to find someone to do something great for them. And that's because it's a really, really inefficient market. You have Dan and the likes of Dan who are great at what they do and looking for customers. And you have customers who are looking for someone reliable and trustworthy to do their work. And this kind of information asymmetry or inefficiency is the kind of thing that technology was built to fix, right? Um, you, you kind of have all these, uh, you know, your Ubers of the world, Airbnbs and Bs of the world. Technology is best when it makes a market way more efficient um, than it previously was and reduces the amount of information asymmetry between two people. So that's what we do. Can do as a, a marketplace, we connect a dam to homeowners that are looking for work by giving them more information than they would ever have through ratings, reviews, um, profiles, pictures, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. And we also help him connect with businesses because there are some businesses that have um services attached to what they do um such as a, an insurance company or a property management company or a hardware store that want to work with guys like dan and bring them into their supply chain but can't do it because they don't know anything about a dan um they don't know kind of how to actually make him um succeed in their environment and that's what we do and we do that using technology we have very cool workflow management tools that allow Dan to understand, hey, this is where I should start the job. My phone shows me my GPS for where I need to be. Um, these are the kind of checklist jobs that I need to do. And it de-risks. And, and I think this is the big part of what the work that we do is de-risking using, bringing a Dan into your home by giving you the information. De-risking using a Dan in your business by making it easy for him to connect with you. And technology allows us to do that very easily. So in terms of impact for our professionals, since we've been um, uh, alive, I guess, we've given about over 200 rand, million rand worth in work opportunities to our professionals. The average pro makes about a month's additional income on our platform. 61% of our pros have been referred to other people by Kandua customers. And I, I love that because it, it, it just shows the, the multiplier effect that you have when you connect a service provider to a customer, there's more jobs that come as a result of that because they're going to refer, they're going to use them again, and they're starting to build their own um, client base that they can start to build a, um, a, a real business through. And then beyond that, we act as a platform because we are the first people to really um, and um, to to really give service providers access to these markets, new customers, um, and a, and let's say a pathway to to business building. We're a great platform for other products and services that they could have otherwise used. Right, things like access to finance, things like training, things like CRMs and invoicing and quoting tools. We're able to give them access to those kinds of products and services, not only because you know we, we have a database that um, is very specific um, and, and can do that, but also because we understand demand. And, and I think that's a really interesting point that you know we we try and push through is that you know the you, you know the 70 odd thousand jobs that we've had come through our platform act as information that we can use to know what services and products are the most useful for our stakeholder which is the professional and so that that's what we're building out is really a platform that allows these service providers who are great at what they do to come on 
you know, build out a, a um, let's say, a name for themselves online, build out a, all using their phone, build out a workflow to be able to grow their business um, and continuously get more products and services through, um, through our platform. So to bring it back to Dan, uh, and um, it's always a great example because he was one of the first service providers on our platform. He now has over 120 reviews, which are nearly all five stars. He worked out through the jobs that we were giving him that a great niche for his business was in door hanging. So he's a door specialist and he, he does hang, he hangs doors. We've helped him and kind of do lots of these jobs, not only for um, standalone customers, but at Leroy Merlin, which is, you know, the third biggest hardware store in the world and um, that is now in South Africa. Dan is one of their preferred pro providers to hang doors that customers buy when they come into the store. Um, not to mention, he's actually now he bought a, a Toyota, um, a Mazda, I think it was an RX-8. I'm just waiting for someone to, okay, great. I'm just waiting for someone to tap in. So yeah, so just to, um, and I think I gave you a very quick and, um, and short introduction to what we do as Candua. Um, and just to, to round things up and, and to bring it back to the conference that we're having today, um, I want to talk a little bit very quickly um, just on the um, what from an entrepreneur's perspective um, and, and from a startup perspective, um, we found kind of engaging with um, impact investors and investors kind of more. Um, so what, what we found was that, you know, we are an SME focused mission driven and, and we say that very much with um the knowledge that in our in our space and technology people don't like that very much um but we are a mission driven company where um our mission is around shortening the distance between having a skill and living um, and making a living from it and we wear that with pride and it also orients how we build our business and you know i think we find that a lot of people speak to the benefits of um SME um, or, or rather the um, elements of SME supports and SME funds, et cetera, et cetera. Um, but for, for us, we, I think one thing that we'd like to see um, um, as, as a startup is really what that means, because um, I think we find that it's almost, uh, um, it's working backwards, right? It's kind of, you know, um, how do we get our returns and then how do we make it um, or how do we find a way to bring SMEs into it? Um, and, you know, I think one thing as a, as a startup squarely focused on SMEs that we'd like to see is, you know, SME-centric um, funding um, and SME support-centric um, metrics, right? So what does it really mean to be supporting SMEs? What does that mean in terms of um, access to market? What does that mean in terms of access to training products and outcomes that are useful for, for SMEs? I think that's one. And the second is we're also in, a, um, I guess, the interesting um, seg um, middle ground between um, a charity and a business um, and I think in other um, environments they call that a social enterprise. Um, now in our environment in, in South Africa it doesn't actually make a difference so we almost find ourselves kind of straddling the two um, and it, I thought it would just be an interesting topic to um, suggest um, you know some some because um, it seems like there's uh, a lot of people that it's nice to suggest things to in this room um, but suggest some sort of um, kind of blended way of thinking about businesses that have a that are mission driven um, but are looking to be sustainable um, similar to your, how you might have the the kind of social enterprise brackets in the UK. The last thing um, was you know around development and government funders. Um, again, that that's just a matter of um, you know trying to know it, knowing where to look. Um, I, I think and knowing what conversations to have. Um, we, you know we we, we uh, have our heads down do, doing the good work, and it's not always necessarily clear um, where we should be looking for support and what kind of support we should be looking for from where. Um, and you know I think again as um, 
in the business that we are in of tech and user experience. And um, there's a lot of value we um, take from simplicity. Um, and, and I think there's, um, we, we would definitely appreciate um, being able to know, hey, this this department does this for this and um, and really understanding in, in quite, let's say, layman's terms, um, where the support is from from the the kind of developments and government funders. I suspect we might be um, a layer to um, a layer removed, um, given the preference to to kind of um, go for kind of funds of funds and things like that. Um, but you know, maybe we're not. I I, I don't know. Um, so um, greater transparency and, and connection to those kinds of funders, I think, um, would would be something we'd ask for. So yeah, thank you very much for for listening. Um, I hope you check out uh, candua.com, have have a read of what we do, um, and look forward to hearing the rest of the speakers. Um, can, can you hear me? Uh, yes, thank you very much. Um, so, so to start, um, I attended one of the global steering groups um, in which Nick was present uh, a number of years ago, in fact, three years ago. And I think Nick was asked the question at the at the meeting, what he regards as success. And he said that impact investing through the network um, succeeds in Africa. So for him, that was what success uh, meant. So it's very interesting that we're sitting here today to talk about climate adaptation notes, because we believe the climate adaptation notes very much comes out of the impact investing um, movement. Right. Thanks very much. Can everyone hear me? Right. So the, the notes have recently been endorsed by the Global Climate Lab, which is arguably the foremost institution in climate financial instrument development and has over the past six years endorsed 49 instruments that has catalyzed $2.1 billion in climate adaptation and mitigation projects in the developing world. The notes are the first instrument to endorsed by the recently constituted Southern African Climate Lab under the Global Labs umbrella. We can get by without electricity, but we cannot survive without water. The number of people without clean water and adequate sanitation in our targeted geographic area, the 16 countries of Southern Africa is significant. The notes hope to meet this challenge by funding resilient infrastructure recognizing that fiscal-based public funding is severely constrained and exacerbated by COVID. As an alternative, the notes intend to tap into the substantial private sector saving pool, which exceeds $500 billion in the region. Um, as set out in the graphic, the notes are funded through an innovative platform that combines pre and post construction finance into a single and seamless instrument which is credit enhanced by DFIs. For developers, combining short-term construction financing from commercial banks with long-term post-construction refinancing reduces the timing and financing costs, leading to a more adaptation project, sorry, more adaptation projects being developed. For investors, the instrument allows institutional investors to leverage commercial banks' construction project expertise, facilitating the deployment of significant long-term debt capital into operational adaptation projects to an asset-backed um, infrastructure instrument. Commercial banks in turn benefit from this long-term capital commit commitment as it overcomes their capital constraints under Basel III, allowing them to offer more favorable um, uh, pricing. Sorry, I'm having to multitask here. Right. Um, based on an initial pro program of $125 million, which we believe is actionable, we've estimated that projects can increase water treatment capacity by 19 megalitres per day, reaching at least 90,000 people. Access to water and sanitation is a critical priority for COVID recovery, and the notes support progress towards seven SDGs, including, including clean water and sanitation and sustainable cities. Financial structures and sources of funding only become relevant with an identifiable pipeline. In the development of the notes, we have, with the support of our consultative group and the reach of the lab, identified a pipeline of $7.8 billion, which is 70 times the proposed pilot program. Big Bang approaches seldom work, 
So we have progressed the phased, out, phased rollout of the notes, starting with the countries that make up the Southern African Custom Union, which enables the use of local debt capital markets and mitigates foreign exchange losses. Climate adaptation notes is ready to begin the implementation phase as mapped out in the slide. The consultative period is complete, a licensed fund manager is in place, and we have obtained a favorable legal opinion on the instrument structure. Next steps for pilot implementation are outlined on the slide and are underway. We have consulted widely with 29 institutions during the development of the notes. They re represent all relevant aspects of the proposed note structure and its implementation and their support is unanimous. Um, the proponents of climate adaptation notes, Heather and myself, and both GFA and RBN provide the enabling environment to, take, to make the notes happen. From pipeline development through to fund management and impact reporting, our backgrounds combine investment banking, development finance, asset management, and impact investing. With financial support, we believe we can leverage $1 in grant funding towards $350 in investment based just on the initial pilot program. After that, the opportunity is exponential with no more sunken costs. Um, thank you for your time, and please make us help. Please help us make a concept conceived some time ago become a reality. Thank you, Jonathan, for that comprehensive presentation and that call to action towards the end. Um, the next presentation is an affordable housing presentation and showcase looking at impact investing opportunities in the sector, and we'll highlight some of the bottlenecks in capital raising. We welcome Paul Jackson, the CEO of TAF. Paul, um, over to you as you show your presentation. Um, so this is a, a, a discussion about TAF and the impact uh, investing that it undertakes. Um, essentially, TAF is a commercial property financing company that focuses on inner city areas in decline and on township areas um, um, more recently. Um, we've got a national presence in, in eight of, of, of our metros. And essentially, over the last 17 years, we've financed nearly 44,000 units. We've offered um, 6.2 billion rand in financing um, um, throughout the country to property entrepreneurs. In other words, we're not a housing finance company. We're a SME financing company with a housing outcome. Um, and our funding objectives, in addition to making um, competitive commercial returns to our investors, is about creating entrepreneurs, um, supporting them. We have a number of programs uh, related to, to entrepreneurs, including the Intertugo Equity Program, that is a parallel program to our commercial funding that supports um, particularly a new uh, entrance to the market, black property, uh, uh, economic empowerment, urban land reform. Um, urban regeneration has a very strong local economic development um, um, uh, component to it by investing in an area using local skills um, and promoting local economies. We're getting inclusive growth. And I've already touched on the urban land reform. So in a nutshell, um, tough pursues an inclusive growth and transformation objective. Um, entrepreneurial growth is key to the outcome of what we do. Um, I've talked about local economic development, but essentially it, look, it looks at funding buildings, new builds, um, small buildings, large buildings, convert, conversion of buildings to SMEs of, of various sizes and stimulating the economy by introducing liquidity into redlined and market failure areas. Um, this comes with a lot of job creation, skills development, use of local skills. The urban den uh, regeneration and more importantly, urban densification, I'm going to come back to this point in a moment, is a, a very, very important uh, uh, um, development objective of Tufts, given the extent of urban sprawl in the, in, the, in the country. This 
investment in, in, in urban areas brings about a fiscal impact. And really, we worry about what is the net effect on government? Is there a net fiscal improvement through stimulating the rate space through consumption of utility consumption and in the South African context, payment for utilities, um, and then actively promoting land reform, urban land reform. One of the biggest um, components that we face is the belief in ordinary people with local knowledge. And there's a phenomenon going on in South African cities that is and a massive number of developments, um, of small and medium-sized developments, 20 units here, four units there, 60 units in another place. And this um, phenomenon is happening in our cities and it's gaining momentum and well underway over a number of years. And uh, our very strong um, um, perspective is, how do we facilitate this? How do we um, support it in a way that we're not creating urban slums, that we are getting a, 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 um, a good quality of housing stock and mixed use developments, not only housing by itself, but really looking at habitats, looking at settlements, looking at um, uh, human settlements going forward. Um, here is a, an example of a building that we financed. This is the before picture. It was a light industrial building. And one of our clients, Soli Ramalomula, changed it into that. Um, at a more township level, here's a, a developer that, that got a piece of land, demolished the house, and developed a, a um, I think this one was a eight or 12 unit development. And then the last, because we don't like to leave Cape Town out, um, a refurbishment and densification of, um, of, of housing in the Salt River area. Um, so what are we talking about? What we're saying is that South Africans have a very strong propensity for um, large projects. And what we are saying is we need to promote this concept of massive small. If we can do 10,000 20 unit projects per annum um, using local entrepreneurs, we are likely to have a much better effect. And what are those effects like? Housing policy from 94 was about building houses, it was a housing policy. And we, as South Africa, achieved a, a remarkable goal of building around 4,000 of these houses. Um, it changed the policy with breaking new ground to human settlements. And this was consistent with the research that shows that urban densification is absolutely a requirement for social and economic in, in interaction. And the second part of the research is showing that developments on the um, periphery of, of, of cities are likely to entrench poverty rather than alleviate it. The fiscal impact of urban sprawl is negative, where um, the fiscal impact of um, of um, densification, my apologies, um, is is net positive, simply because you're using existing physical and social infrastructure. And if you've got scarce tax rands, that's where you need to be placing them. So, what does this mean? Um, Tuff has developed many more units using private sector organisations than. Um, Social housing has put together. Um, we many times larger than big housing projects like Cosmo City, Savannah City, and all without a single rand of subsidy or, or public sector direct subsidization. And the reason for this is that many small projects all in city have lower transaction costs. They broader based participation. There's a lot of empowerment, there's a lot of urban land reform, and there's increased access to finance for, for property entrepreneurs. Um, and so we are very strongly committed to in-city developments using many small projects um, um, to grow um, um, local economies and to promote um, uh, transformation. So, these are some of the people that have financed us. 
Um, you can't lend that kind of money without having access to the capital markets. And you'll see some DFIs there, but you'll see a lot of asset managers and a lot of um, of the uh, commercial banks, or not a lot, two of them, um, but showing that there is a, a really a business case for this. So we are starting to develop more sophisticated ways of, of doing this. And essentially, initially, we did all on balance sheet um, funding. Um, but we, a few years ago, listed a, a domestic medium term note program. And then uh, uh, just over a year ago, launched a very successful securitization, which was oversubscribed. And the pricing was well within our price guidelines. Um, and so where are we looking for opportunities? Uma Standi is the township backyard rental uh, financing program. We're one of a number of companies financing in these areas, but the demand for this kind of accommodation, uh, particularly in that sort of Mandalay, Kailiche area in uh, Cape Town, in the Suet, Greater Soweto area in, in Joburg, is absolutely um, solid, consistent. There's very deep demand. And the number of entrepreneurs willing to take up this challenge um, is, is uh, are also remarkable, doing it with and without funding from Muma Standi. The Intertugo Equity Fund um, is, is required to uh, 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 promote uh, black economic empowerment, promote changing and complexion of ownership. And um, that funding is remarkably hard to get getting empowerment empowerment funding for black property entrepreneurs is 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 difficult but we've made great progress uh with the jobs fund with um uh, various um organizations who who believe that stimulating local economies promoting inclusive growth um, participation by a broad range of people in business in employment opportunities is absolutely important Lutlaza is Tufts, and I'm very glad I just followed uh, Jonathan first uh, presentation, but is Tufts um, green uh, funding. Now, I just want to emphasize Tufts doesn't do green financing. We do green in all of our financing. Lutlaza is a particular uh, fund that we have, uh, or, or standard that we have developed, and we are now in advanced negotiations on funding on that to, to meet. Um, green objectives around energy efficiency and water saving particularly. And then urban management is another very, very important issue. You can't have vibrant um, um, urban developments, uh, urban densification without important urban management interventions, um, the central role of local government um, in that aspect, particularly around social infrastructure, uh, particularly around the broader urban management um, um, requirements. And I'm going to just stop there. Thank you very much, uh, Shiluba. Thank you, Paul, for sharing on TAP's inclusive growth and transformational approach, but also linking it to the green initiatives that you are involved in. Um, next up, we hand over to Voyan Toy, who is the co-managing director of the Old Mutual African Infrastructure Investment <clears throat> Managers Fund. Welcome, Vuyo, and over to you. Okay. Thank you very much, and uh, good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, it's a pleasure and a privilege for me to uh, present some of Old Mutual's uh, impact investment ideas. Um, as Shaluba mentioned earlier, I'm the Joint Managing Director of African Infrastructure Investment Managers, or AIM, which is the business that houses the group's uh, infrastructure equity investment capabilities. Just speaking to uh, the broader group, uh, I think uh, we've got a significant uh, impact and, uh, and green economy presence. Um, the group is uh, 175 years old and um, through investment focused subsidiaries uh, invests in both debt and equity. Uh, the group has 136 billion rands invested in the green economy and impact space and a national footprint across sectors <coughs> such as energy and infrastructure, which I'm responsible for, agriculture, affordable housing, 
and affordable private education, among others. Our business as well is uh, quite uh, focused on uh, impact. Um, we um, have 12 professionals that are dedicated to environmental, social and governance aspects of our portfolios. And from an SDG perspective, we've uh, looked at um, the SDGs which we are fully aligned to and identified 14 of the 17 SDGs that we believe we can most impact through our current mandates. And those are the ones we focus on from an impact perspective. Um, there's a whole bunch of impact in the various mandates and areas that we cover. And I'll just speak to uh, a couple of them. Um, I think uh, an example is, for instance, that um, our portfolio has delivered over 3,000 gigawatt hours of clean power in 2019, which is the equivalent of approximately a million homes powered, uh, which is a quite significant impact from a, from a, from a climate perspective. We have over uh, close to 2,000 megawatts uh, in total contracted power, which is renewable energy in, in, in South Africa. In our education portfolios, uh, we, we, we've delivered 41 um, quality affordable schools and uh, the portfolio has, uh, has um, serviced over 23,600 learners and employed over 1,400 staff. We also have a significant portfolio of assets uh, in, in, in the road space and uh, um, those, that portfolio has had uh, uh, an impact as, as an economic growth enabler. Now, um, I have pleasure in uh, presenting uh, some of our capabilities that are currently in fundraising mode. And uh, I'll speak first to the Edu Fund. The Edu Fund is a successor fund to um, the first education impact fund in South Africa, which was called SAFSA. Uh, that fund had uh, an impact on 23,600 learners uh, through the 41 schools that I mentioned earlier with 1,400 staff uh, em employed. Um, the, 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 the impact investment business has a strong track record of financing and investing in uh, development of, of quality private education. And it's committed over 1.4 billion rand into affordable schools. Um, 90% of that portfolio uh, was, 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 was into affordable schools. Um, the business is now currently targeting 1.5 billion rands in total, in total raise, um, with a broader scope to include middle-income schools as well, as well as tertiary education and education services as well, and uh, is targeting to, uh, to, to, to a return of CPI plus 6.5%. I'll speak to uh, the Ideas Fund, which I'm very uh, familiar with being uh, the co-portfolio manager of that fund. Um, it's a 14 billion rand open-ended infrastructure and development assets fund, which has been in existence over the past 21 years. And over that 21 years has had a strong performance track record and outperform outperformed its target return of CPI plus, uh, plus 7%. Uh, the portfolio is uh, probably the single largest investor in uh, uh, equity in the South African Renewables Program, and uh, the, the, the portfolio's assets have generated almost 25% of all renewable energy delivered into the South African grid. Um, over the, uh, the, the 21-year track, rec track record, I mentioned that the fund has outperformed its uh, CPI plus 7% target. And, and it is indeed um, the flagship fund of our South African um, equity uh, investment initiatives. Uh, the fund is currently looking at raising an additional um, one and a half billion rands, and it seeks to uh, continue its investment into, uh, into uh, impact sectors such as uh, infrastructure and other developmental assets. And um, yeah, we, we were available to uh, get to uh, investors who are interested in making an investment there. Uh, from a contact perspective, uh, I think I've put some contact details there for um, the person who can be contacted relating to the funds, Selina Nalani. 
Um, but I think the key message from um, our offering is really the fact that uh, you don't have to sacrifice returns in order to have impact. And that's shown by uh, the long track record of positive performance in uh, the funds which, which have delivered the most impact in, in our portfolio. Thank you very much. Thank you, Voyeur, for that presentation. Lastly, we are pleased to have Nursa Naidu, um, Chief Executive of Sanlam Investments, to share more on the Impact Fund. Over to you, Nursa, and your presentation will be loaded shortly. Thank you very much, uh, Shaluba. I'll just give it a couple of seconds to come up and uh, say good evening to everyone and thank you very much for the opportunity to present to you today. Uh, I'm just going to talk to you about two things really and, uh, and try and keep it uh, um, a little bit brief. Um, I think many, uh, if not all of you, might be familiar with the Sunlam Group. Um, Sunlam has been operating in, in South Africa for uh, more than 100 years now uh, and I think uh, you know, it was our previous uh, Chief Executive Officer Ian Kirk would always say that uh, without a successful South Africa, there is no Sunlam. Um, and from that perspective, the business, you know, is, is very much invested um, in the sustainability of South Africa and its uh, and its people as well. So, um, sustainability as an agenda from the from the group perspective is is quite critical to us. Uh, and from an asset management perspective, I think what I would say is that we, you know, we're very acutely aware of the uh, role that asset managers and capital allocators more generally need to play now in terms of uh, sustainability and mobilizing capital into the areas that uh, that are most needed. Um, in terms of what I specifically, or the two things that I specifically wanted to talk to you about today, the first being the, the investor's legacy range of funds. Uh, and uh, I see my slide has just come up. Um, so I'll jump, uh, I'll jump across to the, um, to the one that I need, uh, which is that one. Um, so the investor's legacy range was really set up as a, as a response to the COVID-19 pandemic. You know, I think uh, all of us are familiar with what happened with COVID-19. Um, economies around the world went into hard lockdowns, uh, including us here in South Africa. Um, and that had a very, very material impact, you know, on, uh, on companies in South Africa and uh, on economic growth, but uh, more, most especially on jobs. You know, and I think uh, sitting in Sunlam, thinking about sustainability, thinking about what our role what our role needed to be, uh, particularly through the COVID-19 pandemic, uh, and listening to our clients and, and what the market was saying, I think what we what we became acutely aware of was that um, there was an urgent need for us to try and get capital uh, mobilized into into businesses in the country to you know help bridge them through the the hard lockdown period, um, and essentially you know the the, the core thesis of the of the uh, the legacy fund range. Uh, was to preserve jobs and and also to build a platform to to create or accelerate you know job creation going forward. Uh, so it was acknowledging the point that if we weren't able to bridge a lot of the um, the companies you know across the hard lockdown and and I guess more generally through the lockdown period of COVID nineteen, we were going to be losing um, potentially millions of jobs, um, and that capital was needed to get into into those countries or companies rather. We also decided that we couldn't really wait for a for a fundraising effort. Um, because the, the need for the capital was immediate. Uh, so Sunlam put 2.25 billion rand of its own capital into the funds. Um, there are three funds, um, a corporate debt fund, which is there to support um, mid-size and large corporates through debt financing. Uh, there's an SME debt fund, um, which is supporting SMEs with, with, again, debt financing. And then there is a private equity fund, which is providing equity financing into uh, mid-market companies in South Africa. Uh, all of this really with the intention of, of helping those sustainable companies preserve preserve the jobs of uh, of people um, and build platforms to to accelerate their growth and then you know create jobs uh, in future. So I'm, I'm I'm quite happy to 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 let you know that uh, you know two of those funds, the two closed ended funds, actually uh, achieved their first closes and are uh, currently deploying capital into companies in South Africa. Uh, those would be the SME debt fund and the private equity fund. The corporate debt fund is uh, is an open-ended fund, uh, so that one has been lending money to to mid-sized to large companies uh, since day one, since we put the capital in. Uh, so we've currently got uh, just on three billion rand uh, deployed in those funds and, and currently being invested, and we're looking to raise another you know another five billion rand from the market 
uh, in subsequent closes in the closed ended funds and you know on an ongoing basis on the on the corporate debt fund from a sustainability perspective more generally i think we you know we quite uh, we're quite comfortable using the sustainable development goals as a framework you know to guide our thinking in terms of measuring the impact of these funds and specifically with this range of funds um, you know the, the 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 goals we are targeting or trying to support are and one, three, eight, and ten, which are no poverty, good health and well-being, decent work and economic growth, and reduced inequalities. So that's the investors' legacy range. You know, we'll continue to raise capital in the market across the three funds um, and deploy company uh, capital into those companies in South Africa, very much focused on preserving and creating jobs going forward. Uh, the last thing I'll mention, um, and there's no slide for it, but uh, but I think just uh, just to talk about, given some of the other things that have been on the agenda today. Uh, we've got a joint venture with the with the Dutch Development Bank FMO, um, where we have a business. Um, it was referred to on one of the previous uh, speakers' presentations called Climate Fund Managers. Um, climate Fund Managers is a specialist climate fund uh, climate finance business um, set up to try and you know deal with the challenges of climate change and specifically address the SDGs around that. Uh, Thirteen around climate change. I think it's seven around uh, um, renewable energy. Uh, as well as um, the SDGs around the water cycle. Uh, so we, we, we raised a, a clean energy fund there, Climate Investor One, which was an $850 million um, fund, which is currently deploying capital into emerging markets in Asia, um, Africa, and Latin America, uh, into clean, clean energy projects there from you know, hydro to solar to wind. And we are currently fundraising for Climate Investor Two, which is a water and oceans fund, a very, very exciting vehicle. Uh, we are expecting to to get to fund uh, close or first first fund close there early next year, um, and the water and oceans fund will then deploy capital into you know all parts of the water cycle um, and investing in in clean uh, clean oceans and so forth. Um, so climate invest uh, or climate fund managers very much um, one fund set up and deploying capital into energy markets uh, or emerging markets for clean energy, and the second one currently in fundraising for a water and oceans fund. Uh, so I'll leave it there. Thank you very much. Thank you, Nusan, um, for that presentation. Um, greatly appreciated. We thank all three funds on allocating necessary capital towards impact ventures in South Africa. The second last presentation um, for the day will be a presentation by Fabian, um, who was appointed on the 1st of March as NASPA's foundry head. Um, Fabian will speak on the crucial role NASPA's foundry plays in growing South Africa sector through their 1.4 billion rand funding initiative. Over to you, Fabian, and a warm welcome. NASPA's foundry is a 1.4 billion rand South Africa focused early stage tech investment vehicle. We back high caliber founders in highly scalable businesses that operate in sectors that address big societal needs or are aligned with the group's key focus areas. The Foundry team was the first team to come and say, look, we see the vision, we see the potential and all, we're investing in the team, great potential, we're going for it. That mindset was groundbreaking for us. The investment from Foundry has been amazing for the business. It's obviously income coming into the business and fuel to help us grow. It's huge from a validation perspective, just getting that belief that someone else buys into you and backs you as a, a founder in an early stage company is great. Also buying you the headspace to focus on building this value and focusing on your customers is huge. Our role is to ensure the optimal allocation of capital within the sector. We need to select the best startups and we need to leverage our networks in order to facilitate their success. So, so maybe let me start by providing a little bit of context on, on the NASPAS Group. So the NASPAS Group is one of the uh, largest tech investors and operators in the world. Now, NASPAS Foundry is part of a 4.6 billion rand NASPAS made to South Africa um, at the 2018 South Africa Investment Conference. So the, the first 3.2 billion uh, was to be reinvested into uh, NASPAS's existing South Africa consumer internet assets uh, with 1.4 billion rand earmarked for the foundry. So that 1.4 billion rand makes the foundry one of the largest, if not the largest, South Africa focused early stage 
take investment vehicle. So a little bit more around our investment strategy. So Naspers Foundry invests in exceptional founders who operate highly scalable businesses. We invest in for-profit businesses that are post-revenue and at series A funding stage or later. We invest in sectors that are aligned with the group's uh, key focus areas, and these include fintech, edtech, marketplaces, uh, and food tech. We also invest in sectors and businesses that address big societal needs. Some examples of those include ag tech or health tech, so agriculture or, or healthcare focused uh, technology businesses. And you'll notice that a lot of these sectors are, are strongly aligned uh, with some of the, uh, the UN Sustainable Development Goals. And then lastly, we are a, we're a long-term investor. Uh, we're a, a minority equity investor. Um, our investment approach is, is one of collaboration. Uh, it's one of partnership. Uh, we take a founder-friendly approach. We collaborate with exceptional founders, as I said, um, as well as like-minded investors. And then we're, we're an active investor. So what that means is that we, we go beyond the capital that we contribute in order to add value, in order to leverage the group's vast expertise and networks in order to add value to our portfolio companies. Our broader mission is to boost the South African early stage uh, tech sector, and through that, leave a long lasting impact on the broader South African economy. So to date, the foundry has uh, concluded four investments. Uh, the first of those uh, is Sweeps Off. So in uh, July of last year, we announced a 30 million Rand investment um, into, into Sweep South, which is the um, online home cleaning services marketplace. Secondly, um, earlier, earlier this year in May, we announced a 100 million Rand investment into aerobotics. Aerobotics is uh, an ag tech business that uses drones and artificial intelligence to deliver tree crop health and yield data. Thirdly, uh, in September of this year, we announced an investment into Food Supply Network. Food Supply Network is a uh, B2B marketplace that operates in the food service sector. And then finally, uh, tomorrow morning, we are scheduled to announce our, our fourth transaction. Um, all I'll say on that note is that it is an online, uh, an online uh, learning platform. Uh, and the business operates in the so the business operates in the ed tech sector. Now, to give you a little bit more color into, you know, into each of our investments, and and indeed, you know, provide some examples of how we are combining impact as well as uh, attractive investment returns um, by participating in in the early stage. Uh, tech ecosystem. So back to SweepSouth. So to give you some detail on SweepSouth, this is a business that addresses an acute pain point. So for the customer, on, on the one hand, um, it provides a convenient means of arranging a vetted domestic cleaner. And for the domestic cleaner, on the other hand, um, it provides flexible work opportunities at a fair wage. Now, at the moment, there are around 4,000 uh, sweep stars active on the platform. Um, a large number of those are women who are single parents and, and have multiple dependents. But this business is, is more than just the impact it's having, right? For us, this represented an attractive commercial opportunity um, not only is the, the core business continuing to, to grow, um, but there's also the potential to expand into related services. Um, for instance, one could, for instance, um, uh, arrange a, a plumber or an electrician um, on the platform. And then there's the, the, the potential to expand the business geographically. 
into emerging markets that have similar characteristics to South Africa and who are experiencing uh, similar pain points. Our second investment then uh, is aerobotics. So aerobotics uses drones um, that, are, that are, have cameras affixed to them um, and then and they survey uh, tree crops. They then process this data using computer vision um, and, and artificial intelligence uh, in order to deliver tree crop health and yield. And when I say tree crop, I, I, I'm talking um, mostly about citrus. So to deliver tree crop health and yield data,